Welcome to the Creature Shop at Leaveson Studios here. We do all the prosthetic makeup, animatronic creatures, CG models, anything like that. We maintain a load of things here for people visiting so they can just see stuff. And so in our foyer here, we have things like our hippogriff here and a thestral here, um, which are examples of two completely different approaches because this is a CG model in that it's a sculpt that's been painted and made to look lovely but it's being scanned by a laser and the creature itself is being built in the computer. This hippogriff is a functioning model, so this creature is basically a machine. When something actually has to move, it becomes quite difficult to manufacture. Every feather is cut individually, it's coloured individually and glued on individually. And we made three of these things. Um, so it's months and months and months of work for a large crew but it's the only way you get something that actually moves like real flesh or like a real creature. The object of the exercise with any of these creatures, it's that it looks as real as possible so that you can go totally close on it and it can be seen, you know, 100 feet across on a massive cinema screen in close up and it'll hold up. And then through here, we have a whole variety of smaller objects. I mean, we have little dragon cages, Mad-Eye Moody's leg, monster books, shrunken heads, Mrs. Norris, Fang the dog. This is a stunt dog for the second movie, just because they were driving the car through the woods and you couldn't put the real dog in the back of the car. But this stunt dog did actually move by radio control and it did dribble like the real dog as well, which we put in just really to upset Rupert, but it, it does work. We have werewolf suits, Dobby the house elf down here, and various goblin werewolf maquettes, and frozen bodies. In the second movie, uh, the kids who get, and nearly headless Nick, who get uh, paralyzed by seeing the basilisk, we made silicon dummies of those, which have to be shot in close up, so they're very detailed. Goblins from the first film, these are background heads up here, so they're pretty crude. Nothing like the stuff we're producing at the moment. But, you know, for their time, they did the job. We tend to fill up the shelf space with maquettes, primarily because we have tours and things, people coming through and they see stuff. But it also reminds us, if we're going back to a character that's working, you know, if you're, if you're doing greyback, like these are all greyback maquettes. I mean, most of our characters, they start off as sketches. And then you progress to larger concepts. And after that, actual makeup pieces, things like that. So. We leave these out because it just reminds people sort of the stages we went through to arrive at something. Because sometimes you end up with something that's actually very simple, very straightforward, but the road to getting there is very complex. You're coming into the moulding area now, into our mould shop. This is where sculpts come to actually be moulded so that we can produce out of those moulds the flexible silicon or foam latex actual bits that get used. We do this for every single character. And I mean, if you look around the room, there's an awful lot of moulds here, but there are 40-foot containers on the back lot just filled with moulds from all eight movies. Um, they're all catalogued, you know, they're all photographed. It takes time to produce them, so it actually represents a huge volume of work. If you have a full-grown actor in, and his life cast is probably good for a couple of years, unless he, say, puts on a load of weight or something like that, whereas the kids, they were completely different, especially in the early years. You know, they were dramatically different between movies. So we got them in and it was a whole new thing again, from scratch. This is our art finishing department, and this is where all the silicon pieces come through to be painted prior to being stuck on people as makeups, or to be haired, where we put eyebrows in, like one hair at a time, all of that kind of thing. But this is where the, the art finish occurs. Because all our prosthetic makeup pieces are only used once and then they're discarded, everything has to be reproduced. So everyone in here has to be able to not only paint very realistically, but they have to be able to reproduce the same paint job exactly the same time after time after time. And so something like this, which is a goblin prosthetic piece, there'll be a load of these and they have to match. Not only do they get painted, but they have to be eyebrowed I've asked them to make the eyebrows one hair at a time. They're punched in with needles, which is very, very slow, painstaking, repetitious work. We're in the, um, the animatronic shop here. This is where, basically, we make the things move. Anything that requires a skeleton, and an internal structure that is capable of motion, ends up in here. Practically every piece of metal inside these things is made 
in-house because to make everything fit together, you have to sort of do it from scratch. If you look at this, one of the reasons the movement is so nice and organic is, again, this is a very soft silicon skin. Every hair has been punched in individually. This is all bristle. And it makes the movement become very organic on the outside and just brings it to life. <laughs> Hedwig has sort of been in all the movies at some point where the real owl is a problem, it's too noisy, you know, or it, it's flapping away in the background. You can put something in that you can control. These, at the moment, are being operated in a very simple way in that we're using radio control transmitters, the kind of thing you would use for a model aircraft. And Jim's operating at the moment, just moving things about. If something gets very complicated and you end up with a whole team of people having to use machines like this, you bring in a computer system and you program it so that you end up with a load more different movements, a whole number of movements, but being controlled by one or two people. We're in the Scout Hut now. Why it's called the Scout Hut, I have no idea. But we do a lot of our big sculpture in here. We have our basilisk from uh, Chamber of Secrets. This is the one that Dan actually stabbed through the roof of the mouth. He's still got all the stuff in it. It has nostril flare and it can open its mouth and uh, its tongue moved and its eyes moved. And it was on a rig along with about 25 feet of the body. So it was quite a big, very basic, but big, tough animatronic. And we have the dead Aragog from uh, Half-Blood Prince, which is pretty battered now but made him completely differently because I wanted to be able to get light to come through the legs. I wanted it to be translucent, like a, a dead, curled-up spider you see in the bath. You know, if you catch the light, they look like they've gone hollow. And that's what I tried to catch with this, which did actually work very well. But it was an incredibly toxic material we made it out of, and everyone had to wear suits and gloves, and it was quite revolting to deal with. And over here we have an early concept piece for the Dementors from HP3. This particular model was made purely to see if we could capture the way a particular type of fabric behaved. This dragon model was specifically made to breathe fire. So this tongue piece here is actually concealing the gun of a flamethrower. It worked fantastically. I mean, it, it was really scary stuff because it never occurred to me that when you actually release gas under pressure and ignite it, it's not just that you get a fireball, you get a very loud noise, and it made all of us jump out of our skins. I've been on this now nearly 10 years. I think the ability to put something that is a fantasy creature in front of people is actually the joy, it's the kick I get. You know if you get it right, if people react to a creature as if it's a real creature. You know, that is a hippogriff and it's standing there in front of you and if you go near it, it'll bite you. You know, I've stood in a wood at night watching a dragon breathe fire. That is magic.